Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name's Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Bill Gehring. And today we're pleased to have a very special guest with us, our County Clerk, Julie Glancy. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. You may have heard me say in the last couple of months that Julie Glancy <laughs> was gonna be with us. And let me assure you, it is, wasn't because she isn't busy. She's been incredibly busy with the election process and all the good things that are coming up here shortly many of the things she's going to be touching on today. So Julie, it's just good to have you with us. Oh, thanks. Nice to be here. Please begin by sharing a little bit about yourself and when you were first elected to the county clerk. Well, I, this is my 14th year as county clerk, and I was in the office about 10 years before that, so I've spent a lot of time in the county clerk's office. Um, I've lived in Sheboygan County my whole life, and before I worked for county clerk, <laughs> I was in the office on aging, and I also worked for clerk of courts for a while, so I kind of have a really wide range of experience in county government. But 14 years as the elected county clerk. Yep. And how many years did you say before that? 10 years. And 10 years, so 24 years in that office. I was six when I started. I, see, I can yeah. see that, <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, please touch on a little bit of the roles and responsibilities of your office. We do a lot of, of kind of unrelated things, but primarily we're the secretary to the county board. We're in charge of administering the election process for Sheboygan County. We issue marriage licenses. We do a lot of kind of smaller things, dog tag issuing to the municipal clerks. We're kind of the official record keeper for Sheboygan County, so we have a lot of kind of unrelated records that we keep. And when you say secretary to the county board, you know, folks might be wondering, well, what's that mean? Well, we take minutes at their meetings. We're responsible for making sure that all of their documents are on file. So if someone needs to get a copy of a resolution or an ordinance, our office is where they would come for that. Uh, we make sure that the meetings are posted in compliance with the open meeting law, which is a huge issue right now. And uh, we are also make sure that that information is on the county website as well. So if your office isn't in play and if you're not posting the minutes or the agendas and preparing the minutes and doing all that, really the county board is in trouble. Yes. Yeah, they're kind of on their own then. <laughs> well, enough said. Yeah. Um, you recently started providing a new service, one that when we say recent, I think it's been the last couple of years now. About four years now. Four years, mm -hmm. providing passports. And I know it's been a real uh, boon, not only to your office, but also for the community, another opportunity to get passports. Please touch on that. Uh, we started doing passports about four years ago. Um, the passport agency opened it up to more than just the post office to be allowed to do it. They've since closed that window, so we kind of got in at a good time. But uh, it, it provides a real service for the people because we've had a lot of people that come into our office say that, friends of theirs waited for an hour at the post office for a passport and they just kind of breeze in our office and go in and out because not all that many people know that we do it so you know the majority of the people still are going to the post office but it's it's a real good service for the people because you need a birth certificate to apply for a passport and if you're born in Sheboygan County you can get that at the Register of Deeds office which is right upstairs from our office we take the pictures in our office so it's kind of a one-stop shop for people if they have to get a, you know, a birth certificate, they can just come right downstairs and do the whole passport application. Uh, recently, you know, I was in there with my family. Mm -hmm. We got our, all our passports for going to Canada for our annual fishing trip. And um, it, it's helpful if folks are prepared with some information. What, what do they generally need well, to have? Well, they need to make sure they have their birth certificate along. They should bring their checkbook with them because you need to send a, a separate check with each passport application. And you also need to pay the counter fee as a separate payment, either by cash or check. You need to know your parents' names and dates of birth, things like that. If you've been married more than once, you're gonna to need to know your previous marriage information, your former spouse's date of birth and where they were born and things like that. And cost, it's not uh, the, the, No, it's not. The price that went up just recently, it's $75 is the fee for an adult passport plus a $25 counter fee, so it's a total of $100. For children, it's $60 plus the $25 counter fee. And then we charge $10 for pictures in our office. And how long does the passport, how long is it good for? It's good for 10 years for adults, it's five years for children. Okay. And the, the turnaround time right now is about four to six weeks. I know last year for a while they were really backlogged and they were looking at sometimes three months. And I know that people kind of lost out on their trips last year because the passport agency was kind of overwhelmed. But uh, they've kind of turned things around, so it's, it's four to six weeks, and we've seen that pretty consistently right now. And I know personally it was a very good experience, and your staff are excellent at providing assistance, taking the photo. If, if anyone's watching this and is thinking, you know, we need to get our passports for a vacation coming mm -hmm. up, 
uh, and they're, they want to talk to somebody ahead of time to make sure they bring the right things. Is there a, a number that... Sure, they can call our office. It's 459-3003. 459-3003, mm -hmm. and whether it's the county clerk, Julie Glancy, or any of your Anybody in staff. my office can help them. Very good. Thank you, Julie. Sure. Julie, your office really has many duties, and I think of taking care of the county board because I'm the county board chairperson, mm -hmm. but I also think about elections. Elections are very important. This is a national election year, but what's going to be on the ballot in April? In April, we have the Justice of the Supreme Court. We have a uh, the Court of Appeals Judge District 2 is on this ballot. All the County Board Supervisors, which of course is very important. Um, a lot of local elections. The City of Sheboygan has some aldermen races. City of Falls and City of Plymouth both have mayor races. Or not a race, but Plymouth has a mayor race. Falls' is mayor is unopposed. But a lot of the local stuff. There's school board on the ballot. Uh, there's a statewide referendum for um, kind of curtailing the powers of the governor to veto um, on the um, budget bill. Right now, he can kind of cross out words and sentences and make whole new meanings, and they want to kind of limit that, which is what the proposed constitutional amendment is. Town of Rhine has two referenda questions. Village of Waldo has a referendum. So there's a lot on this ballot. Yeah. Being both on the county board and the town board, those local elections are important to me. How many county board supervisors are up, or how many contested races? Uh, are there, we have say? six um, contested races. We also have one district, District 26, which is, represents most of the city of Sheboygan Falls, has a kind of a contested registered write-in race, which is kind of unusual. <laughs> there was no candidate on the ballot, but three people have taken out papers now to be a, an official registered write-in candidate for that. But out of the 34 supervisors, there's only six with competition, the one with the write-in, and District 11 in the city of Sheboygan has no one running at all. How about the city council? That's often very contentious. They only have two of their eight have, hmm. con have contested races right now. Okay. Then looking forward to the fall ballot, which really seems far away, but it will be upon us. Aside from the president, will there be other issues um, on the fall Yeah, ballot? Congress 6, which is Representative Petri's district, is up for re-election. Um, all of the um, assembly districts, and we're in 26, 27, and 59. Also, Senate District 20, which is Glenn Grothman's district, is, is up for re-election this year. Okay. And of course, the county offices, which is important to me, <laughs> the county clerk, the treasurer, and the register of deeds, and the district attorney are up for election this year as well. Okay. There might be some listeners out there that might be interested in running for an office down the road. Can you tell us a little bit about how they would sure. go about doing um, that? Sure. It's a little late to register for the, <laughs> for the spring election, although if you're interested in being a registered write-in for District 11 or any of the county board districts, you can register for that in my office. There is a little advantage to being a registered write-in in that the poll workers are kind of watching for your name. You can take a little more leeway in how you look at those names on the ballot, and it also gives you the right to, to officially campaign. And you can do that anytime, even up to the Monday before the election, if you want to, to register for that. But to be on the ballot for the fall election, you need to file, the, the starting date is June 1st for taking out papers for the fall election. You have the whole month of June and a little bit of July to, to get your signatures. But you need to file a declaration of candidacy, a campaign finance registration form, and then for county offices, you need between 500 and 1,000 signatures to have your name on the ballot. If you want to run for any of the state seats, you need to register with the State Elections Board. The timing is the same, but the number of signatures is different. What are your key roles then in the election process? Oh, Lord, we have a lot, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things at the election. We start out, of course, with registering candidates. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the first thing. We also get the ballots put together. And for the spring election, even though it doesn't seem to be a very big election, for us is the most work because countywide we have 108 combinations of county board supervisor, municipal election, and school district elections. So we have to make sure everybody gets their right ballot combination. Um, so we get the ballots put together and printed. We are in charge of programming the equipment, not only the optical scan, which is the one where you write the, you know, make the arrow on the ballot and put it in, but also the touch screen machines that are new. Uh, we also publish most of the ads that you see in the paper for the elections. We are um, the providers for the statewide voter registration system for 20 of the 28 municipalities in the county, which means we enter their voter registration applications, get their candidate information on the, the voter registration system. Uh, after the election, we need to make sure that their, um, everybody who's voted is, is registered as having voted. We also print their poll lists and things like that. 
We've seen a lot in the paper about the accuracy or the decertification in Florida and California of their new voting equipment. Mm -hmm. Have you any concern about the equipment being used in Sheboygan County in Wisconsin? Um, no, I don't. Uh, the optical scan equipment has never been in question in terms of whether or not it's secure. The touch screen equipment, which is what they're decertifying in California and, and Florida, is very much the same equipment we're using. However, those states do not require a paper trail. Mm. When you vote in Wisconsin on the touch screen, your ballot prints out on kind of a little, like a cash register tape looking thing. So the voter actually can verify that ballot and that ballot is kept for any kind of recount purposes or if anybody wants to audit that election, the ballot is there. In the, in the states that are decertifying, they have no paper trail. So you're just relying on what that memory cartridge says happened on election day. Mm. And that's why they're just certifying that equipment is simply because there's no way other than relying on that cartridge to tell you what what the voters actually did. Okay, if there's somebody out there living in Sheboygan County, they've been a resident for some time but never registered to vote. Do they have to register to vote, and how would that? You occur? have to register to vote. The deadline for registering by mail for this April election is passed, but you can register at the clerk's office at whatever municipality you live in. You can also register at the polls on election day. If you do that, you need to bring, or even at the clerk's office, you need to bring proof of residence. That can be your driver's license if it has your current address, it can be a utility bill, um, a rent receipt, just some official paper that shows that that's your, your address. You also need to provide your driver's license number if you have a driver's license. So you need to be prepared to have that information, but you can register right at the polls. Okay. I'm obviously a registered voter, having voted for many years, but I keep getting these things in the mail encourage me to register for vote. What should I do with them? Um, actually, if you're registered to vote, you can throw them away. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, there's, a, there's a lot of st national organizations, and whenever you have a presidential election, you have what a number of groups that are, you know, there's Rock the Vote, and there's a number of them that are really just interested in making sure they get as many people out to vote as possible, which is good. But they send out this information to everyone, whether they're registered or not registered. They just get a list of people who live in a municipality, and they send this out. And it's confusing because many of those things make it look like if you don't send this form in, you won't be registered to vote. And people need to be aware that if they are registered, they can throw that away. We get many of those, almost daily we get a packet from the State Elections Board. Nearly half of the people who send them in are already registered, and it's just extra mail. There is a way now for voters to check to see if they're registered to vote. If you have access to the internet, the statewide voter registration system has a public access port that you can go to. It's VPA for voter public access .wi.gov. And if you go there, you can enter your name and date of birth. It will tell you if you're registered. It will show you the address where you're registered to vote. If that information is correct, then you're, you're good to go. You don't need to send in anything else. If that information is wrong, if you've moved since that, then you need to send in a new voter registration application to change your, your address. Okay. I almost thought I was going to hear you say that we're going to be going to being able to vote over the internet. It, but that's no, not we're not quite, quite there yet. yet. But Voter Public Access is really a very interesting website because it will tell you um, who your, who your, where your polling place is, who your current incumbent office holders are, once the ballots are generated in the system, you can go out there, it will tell you who's all on the ballot in your area. It will also give you your voter history if you're a registered voter. You can also, if you're not a registered voter and just want to know, well, where do I go to vote on election day? If you type in an address, it will tell you what the polling place is for that address. Okay, and then finally, how many polling places are there in Sheboygan County? And I think you've answered one of the questions. There's, how do you find out what yeah, that place might be Yeah, there's uh, 48 report voting places in mm -hmm. Sheboygan County, 16 in the city of Sheboygan, and then, of course, all the municipalities have their own polling place. And like I said, you can go to that website. Um, you can also, when you get, there's a flyer that's in the, that comes out in the mail or in with a newspaper the day before the election, you can check there. Or you can call our office or your municipal clerk and we can tell you where the polling place is also. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. Julie, what was that website, <clears throat> that website that you mentioned a moment ago? Because I could see some okay. viewers wanting it's to write v that down and check VPA, it out. It's VPA, voterpublicaccess.wi.gov, G-O-V. Okay. How about one more time? VPA for voterpublicaccess.wi.gov. G -O -V. So they had three chances now to write it down <laughs> from you doing that. So Sure, or you but, can call our office, and, and or you can go to the State Elections Board website, and there's a link right from their website to it as well. 
Earlier you mentioned that it's a big transition year, that we have 34 county board supervisors, all are up for re-election, only six have competition, mm -hmm. though I think we're going to see, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 10 new faces? Yes, because there are a number of supervisors that aren't running again. That aren't running mm -hmm. and, and have someone else running on a right. post. Right. Uh, big year for the county board, and uh, come April 1st we'll We'll know what the uh, who the new faces new are, faces and are. Mm -hmm. and April eighth we'll have then our first board meeting with the new board. No, April eighth no. is the last meeting of the of the old board. April fifteenth. April fifteenth is the new meeting. So April eighth, the last board meeting of mm -hmm. the current term, and then April fifteenth will be the the first new board meeting of, right. with the new newly elected board members. And I, I think it, this would be an appropriate time to say that, as many of you know, Chairman Gehring has been a county board supervisor's a county board chairman for two full terms and an, and part of a third. Uh, as some of you may recall, uh, Dan Lemieux, State Representative Lemieux, moved on to the State Assembly and Bill completed Dan's term and then was successfully re-elected two subsequent times. So two full terms plus. And uh, this will, this may be Bill's last TV8 program unless of course we have him on for a guest or he returns to a county board chair someday in the future, but uh, Bill will be turning over the reins to a new county board chairman, uh, effective April 15th. Mm -hmm. And Julie, give our viewers just a flavor for, well, what happens on April 15th? How does the county board go about selecting a new chair, vice chair? What are some of the steps? Okay, April 15th, all the board members get sworn in. Mm -hmm. One of their first official acts is to adopt the rules of the board to determine what, how the board will function. Once they've done that, then they need to nominate and elect a county board chairman. That's their, their next job. It's a secret ballot. It's one of the only things that are done on the county board floor that's done by secret ballot. The first ballot is a nominating ballot. So all the supervisors get the opportunity to write the name of someone they think would be a good chairman on a piece of paper. It's collected and tallied and we put it up on, on, a, on a chalkboard. At that point in time, who's ever nominated, some of them will drop out and say, I really don't want to be chair or whatever. And you end up with a slate of, of, of possible chairmen. After that, you have official ballots. And as many ballots as it takes, again, by secret ballot, to, to finally get a majority for one person, and then that person is elected as the chairman. And they follow that same process for vice chairman and the three other members of the, of the executive committee. And then that executive committee gets together and they identify committee assignments and mm -hmm. committee assignments are assignments that uh, each board member will be surveyed to see what committee, standing committee they want to be on. Currently the county board has 10. It may be eight with mm -hmm. some consolidations effective on the 15th. They'll make their, they'll share their preference with the county board chair. The county board chair will then share his or her recommendations with the executive committee. The executive committee then comes back and ultimately they appoint uh, supervisors to their individual committees. Yeah, and that's the, the meeting, the following meeting of the county board. They meet the, the week after the 15th, I think it's about the 22nd, 23rd. And um, at that point in time, the board confirms those appointments to all the committees. And those committees then break for a short time to elect their chair of their committee, vice chair of their committee and things like that and decide when their committees are going to meet. Julie and I have the opportunity to participate in some orientation for our new county board supervisors. Certainly it takes some time to learn how the organization works, 22 departments, $137 million uh, budget, over 200 programs and services, a lot going on. Uh, the county board chairman has an annual leadership forum where the whole board comes together and discusses key issues and, and pertinent information but a very important transition happening here in April. And let me put you on the spot for a moment. <laughs> uh, as you know, Bill's been chair for the last four and a half years, five years, closer to five years. Mm -hmm. How's he done as county board chairman? I think he's done a great job. He runs a really good meeting. I really appreciate that. He, he, he always, he, the thing we appreciate the most is he always announces the name of the supervisor who he's calling on <laughs> because we need to, as secretaries, need to write down who made the motion, who made the second. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you don't have a chairman that's, that's calling on a supervisor by name, you have to rely on, did you hear, hear the person? Did you see whose light was on? to know who to write down, so we really appreciate that. 
behind the scenes, there's a lot that goes on prior to every board meeting. The board meets once a month, and Chairman Gehring will meet with uh, Julie Glancy and the vice chair and myself and go over the agenda. And the chairman will ultimately decide what's on that agenda and who things will be referred to. And of course, Bill has taken an approach where he gets input from others, but the chair has that very important responsibility. And Julie, helping run that meeting with the chair is actually typing in things as people make motions and, and making sure that the meeting goes smoothly and everything's recorded and documented, as she mentioned earlier. So a lot of these things just kind of happen and they don't happen by accident. They happen because you have good leadership or you have good staff in place that keep things moving smoothly. And I commend both these individuals. I'm gonna miss working with Bill Gehring because I think he's been an exceptional county board chair and I'm gonna be glad that he's continuing on the county board as well as glad that we have an exceptional county clerk. Uh, we have 22 department heads. Of those 22 department heads, 16 are appointed, meaning that I would appoint them and they're confirmed by the respective liaison committee. The other six are elected. Julie is one of those elected department heads and she is exceptional. I cannot tell you how fortunate we are in Sheboygan County to have an excellent management team in place and all of the department heads bring a lot to the table. And, and I would be the first to say that you heard Ju Julie mention earlier her experience as county clerk, 14 years. I hope she's here another 14 and then some because she does a fantastic job. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, Julie, you talked about roles and responsibilities earlier, and one of them that I think some people recognize your office for is providing marriage licenses. Mm -hmm. How does that work if someone out there is going to get married or has a son or daughter that's going to get married? How does that relate to your office? Okay, you need to, if you're a Wisconsin resident, apply for your marriage license in the county where at least one of you lives. So if you're residents of Sheboygan County, you would come to us. You need to make sure you have your wedding plan set before you come in because that's one of the things we need to know. You need to apply for your license at least six days before you plan to be married, but not more than 30 days before your wedding because they expire in 30 days, so it mm. would be no good. You both need to come in in person. You need to bring certified birth certificates. You need to bring something that shows your current address. If it's not a first marriage, you need to bring a copy of your divorce papers or death certificate from your last marriage. If you're divorced, it needs to be final for at least six months. The fee is $75, and we're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30 for marriage licenses. We're actually there till 5 o'clock, but if you're not there by 4.30, it gets a little, it's a little hard to get you out the door before they lock the building. But it's a 30-day License. license is good for 30 days. I, I didn't know that. I'll mm -hmm. be darned. So if you, you come in on the 32nd day, and it, <laughs> you could be in trouble. Yep, it'll expire before you get married. Now, they may not necessarily have you individually uh, helping them. It's right. very possible, but you have some excellent staff. P please uh, touch on your staff that you have working for I you. have three staff members. Cher Rousset is the deputy county clerk. Dave Warwine is the accountant, and Cheryl Savon is the secretary to the county board. And between the three of them, they have a fair amount of experience as well. Uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to think. Cher's been there, will be 10 years this year. Dave's been in my office for nine, but he's been with the county for much longer than that. And Cheryl is going to be there five years in about a month. So, One of the other um, things that your department does and does so well is if someone needs a hunting license or a fishing license. And as many of our viewers may know, if they hunt or fish or enjoy the outdoors, is that uh, licenses come up and are due again in March, at least if you're going to get mm -hmm. a patron license, or if it's just an individual fishing or hunting license, they can come by your office and take care of that. Yeah, we don't do as many of those as we used to. It seems like every year that kind of dwindles a little bit because most of the people that come to us are the people that have been coming to us for a long time. Uh, and there is a new system this year for mm -hmm. issuing licenses. It's coming off of a touchscreen computer this year. Um, they're kind of an awful green yeah. <laughs> license this year. They're kind of strange. But um, it, it's still basically just as easy to do it. And we have a, a scanner now where we can scan in your old license or scan in your driver's license, and that will put the information into the system. So, so back to the position of county clerk. Uh, when is the next election that you have to be concerned with if you choose to run again? Uh, this fall. This fall? Yeah, okay. November. Out of sight, out of mind. I haven't even been thinking about that. Yeah. So Papers was go out in June and come back in July and the primary is September and the election is in November. And if, and just to give folks a flavor for that, if they are interested in running for county clerk or another elected mm -hmm. position or just want to learn more about what, what's entailed, that's information that your office right. can provide as well. they can contact well. our office. And this is a four-year term for, for the um, 
offices that are up for election. I, I'm fighting the urge to just ask you, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> are you Are you planning to run again? Yes, Julie? I am. I'm planning to run for this term. Okay, so there you have it. There it's I announced. have it. She's <laughs> coming back. I'm coming back, at least for four years, right? And <laughs> um, this is going to be a challenging four years because not only do you have you know your standard election things but in 2011 which is part of this four-year term is the redistricting you know that every right. every 10 years they do a new census which will be 2010 and then in 2011 is the redistricting and what that entails is you need to make sure that every district every county board district represents the same number of people and because of course you have new new housing developments and population shifts every 10 years you have to kind of reallocate that and I know the board is talking about reducing the size of their board at the 2011 redistricting. So that will be a real challenge this year. And that impacts, of course, all the election processes from that point forward. So in 2012, all the information we have in terms of what voters go with this ballot combination will change with the 2012 elections because of the redistricting. So it's going to be a challenging four years. And I've had some people ask me about that recently, I, I suppose with the election process and play with board members, but they said, well, didn't the board take action to reduce their numbers? Aren't they at 34 now and they're going to, to 25? And the answer is yes, but they didn't want to implement that until actually after the census. Right. And and they, they were really limited if they wanted to change their size before the census because you can't change ward designations between the census periods. You can only change your districts. And we have 16 county board supervisors that each represent just one ward. So the only way to reduce the size of the board between censuses was to cut the board exactly in half. And the board really didn't want to go from 34 to 17. They th felt that 25 was a much, you know, much better number for the county to, to operate on. So they had to wait until the 2012 elections for that. With your years of service with Sheboygan County and specifically in the, in the county clerk's office, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen over the years? The biggest changes are in elections. Election changes have been huge. Um, there's a lot of emphasis right now on security and there's many, many more security regulations in place. Uh, the statewide voter registration system, which has went into effect two years ago, has had a huge impact on our office and in all of the departments, you know, all the municipalities, because you have to enter it in, all the voters have to be entered into one big database. It's much more complex, of course, than keeping their own systems going the way they had been. Um, the um, new touchscreen voting equipment that was required by the HAVA, which was the Help America Vote Act of, of 2002, and required this touchscreen equipment in all the voting locations that's a huge impact on our office because the programming for that is probably 10 times more complex than it was for the for the optical scan equipment. And do you see that trend continuing for a while? That uh, Yeah, it seems like every day there's another set of legislation proposed to, to change security. There's the always the voter ID thing that comes mm -hmm. around periodically. So there's always changes in elections. Very good. Well, Julie, I want to thank you for taking the time to give us an overview of your very important role and responsibilities and, and giving our viewers a snapshot of the, of the important work you do. Thank you. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us today. And on behalf of the Sheboygan County Board and Chairman Bill Gehring, we're very pleased that Julie could be with us today. I hope perhaps two, four years from now, you might see these same people in these chairs. We'll find, well, time will tell, but uh, it's not often that I go in on the limb endorsing a department head, but let me tell you, Julie is just a breath of fresh air. She is very good at what she does. She has an excellent team in place. And uh, again, I thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Next month, we may have Nan Todd in here, a clerk of courts, to get a feel for what's happening in the clerk of, court, clerk of court's office. So until then, again, thank you for joining us.